Hello, this is Grant Loves Books. George Orwell. Nineteen eighty four, yes, of course. Animal Farm, yes. And then what? Did he write anything else? He did. He wrote some really excellent books. I would love to do a review of Keep the Aspidistra Flying. Uh, that book really, you know, I read that book at the right time. Coming Up for Air, I think in all of literature, Coming Up for Air has my favorite opening line of just about any novel I've ever read. I don't... But we're not talking about those George Orwell novels today. Today we are talking about George Orwell's first novel. It's not a novel, actually, it's a memoir. Down and Out in Paris and London. It was published in 1933. George Orwell was, was there at the same time that the Hemingways were there, at the same time that the Fitzgeralds were there, and they lived all very close together in the Latin Quarter. And he wrote Down and Out in Paris and London based on his experience being exceptionally poor and starving for the most part. And he has one friend, the very lazy Russian waiter known as Boris. And the two of them together are trying to concoct these plans on how to get money. And Orwell takes a job as a dishwasher in a hotel restaurant. So Orwell writes this book about being desperately poor and working as a dishwasher. And his descriptions are as good as Dante's depictions of hell. Like that's what George Orwell is writing about. It Working as a dishwasher in this hotel is just hell on earth. It's amazing. It's really, really very good writing. So what happens? Well, he gets a, a telegram saying, please come back to London. You have a job as a private tutor for um, like a disabled child. So, and they forwarded him some money. So he was able to return to England. And then when he got there, to take up this position as a private tutor, he was informed that the, comp the, the family that he would be working for had gone on holiday for a month, and now, again, he was destitute for one month. And he took off his good gentleman's clothes, and he traded them in for some tramps' clothing, and he decided to be a hobo in London for a month to to continue the experience. Now, so that is down and out in Paris and London. It's just like that. It is the life of a man with no money who's trying to survive. Now, the first part of the novel, though, in Paris, feels a lot more like a novel. And the second part of the, of the memoir in London feels quite a lot more like it's reporting or journalism. It, like the first part of the novel, there's a lot of humor, there's a lot of uh, amazing characters. And in the second part of the novel, it's mostly the conditions of homeless persons shelters in and around London and what they expect you to do and the conditions they expect you to live in, the state of the food. So the first part of the novel is much uh, it's more fun for me. And the second part is just a bit more, uh, it, it's reporting. It feels like it's reporting. The reason I wanted to talk about this book. So when I was 26 years old, I left Canada and I went to Europe and my first destination was Lisbon, Portugal, and I thought I would live a Portuguese lifestyle. It's a very long story, but I found my way all the way in Budapest, Hungary, which is, especially in the year 2000, when this is taking place, this was very much an Eastern European country. Like, life was hard. The city was filthy. All of the buildings were black from the um, terrible exhaust fumes from the old cars. All of the buildings were black, and, and Budapest was really... It's a very beautiful city, geographically, and the buildings are very nice, but it really felt like East Europe. And I was desperately poor, like I'd traveled all the way across Europe from Lisbon. So Lisbon, Madrid, Paris, Nuremberg, Prague, and then Budapest, and I was almost out of money. You know, like the money I had was really like, that has to be kept for 
two month rent. I, like that is untouchable money and what's left is, is paltry. So when I got to Budapest, I was very, very poor. And it was quite hard for me because everybody looked at me and said, oh, you're from Canada, you must be rich. But of course I wasn't, I was poor. I, I, I wasn't making Canadian dollars. I was making Hungarian forints for my work. There were months at a time where I would have one meal a day just to conserve. I would have one meal. It would be uh, lentils and it would be uh, ground turkey breast. It's very cheap. It's the, like turkey breast or sausage, you know, the cheapest meat that was available. And bread, because I didn't know how to cook rice back then. So bread, lentils, ground turkey breast, and I would eat that. I would make a big pot of it and I would have one meal and then maybe later in the day I would have a smaller meal, but I would try to keep it for the next day. Like I would just go, like I would wake up and I would have a class in the morning. The language school I worked at, they gave me like eight hours a week because they weren't sure if I was a good teacher. So they gave me those classes and waited to see the result. And I would just go for these long walks. I would wake up and just walk. Now. Budapest is, is divided by the Danube River. So there's the Buddha side and there's the Pesh side. And the Pesh side is the, the student side, the poor side where all the working class people live. And the Buddha side is where the rich people live. I would just wake up and I would walk. And I think I knew Budapest better than most Hungarians, especially if it was in the Kurut. Like if it was in the Kurut, on the Pesh side, I knew every street, every corner, every shop I knew everything on the Pesh side. The Buddha side remained a mystery to me for many, many years because I just didn't like to go over there. Occasionally I would go over there for work, but then I would come back to the Pesh side and, the, and this friend of mine, Mark, he was also in the same situation. Like if we ever discovered like a cheap place to, to buy clothes, we would call each other and say, man, I, I found a place to, you know, where the clothes are really cheap. Or if say we discovered like, like a pub that sold really cheap wine, you know, we'd say, you know, we've got to go to this place. The wine is really cheap there. It was the happiest time of my life. And I was so desperately poor. And every month was just such a struggle. So this would be a typical Friday night with Mark. I would bring over a bottle of wine. We'd go to his apartment. We'd drink wine and cola, Calimocho. And we would play some chess. And then we would go out. We would get some bread and some really cheap sausage and margarine and these yellow peppers in hungarian they're called uh, teve paprika these little yellow peppers and we go back to his place and we'd, we'd eat bread and margarine and salami and these yellow peppers and then we would drink vodka and energy drinks in 2000 and 2001 it was like the golden age of the energy drinks and there was a big one of course red bull but that was the expensive one then there was the hungarian one called bomba but then there were like dozens and dozens of these cheap little imitation energy drinks. There was one, it was in a little plastic container like a grenade and it was called Detonator. There was another one called Kick. There was an energy drink called Cocaine. There was an energy drink called Hell. Hell. Gives you energy like hell. There was another, there was an energy drink called Shark and there was an energy drink called Bruce Lee and we would drink these with vodka. So first Calimocho and chess, little meal, and then we would play cribbage until we were just fucking loopy, <laughs> like really drunk. There was one night, there was one of those big garbage containers across the street and he lived on the fourth floor and we were trying to throw glass energy drink bottles into the container garbage across the street. Imagine we were throwing glass bottles off his balcony because <laughs> we were so drunk and then we would go out mark would take me to these really dirty dangerous nightclubs and it was the greatest now both mark and i we, we both had these dreams of being a writer i don't know how mark ever did with his aspirations to be a writer i didn't do very well i wrote a lot but in the end i think i only had two short stories published and maybe a dozen poems here and there in these, you know, little, but most of the time I didn't even get a copy because they just said, well, we, you know, we can't mail you a copy in oh, Europe. Right. Down and Out in Paris and London, one of my favorite George Orwell books. Like it's very good if you want to know the experience of living 
in that, you know, very close to the earth uh, lifestyle where just everything is desperate, desperate for cigarettes, desperate for food, you know, even if it's just some oatmeal, just something so that you can walk five miles into, you know, to the next shelter for the evening. It's quite good in that way. And, you know, because life in Canada is really quite easy. I know that a lot of Canadians are going to roll their eyes and say, oh, what are you talking about? Life in Canada is very hard for many people and you don't know what you're talking about. But I lived in Eastern Europe for 16 years and I'm back in Canada now and I see the way Canadian people live. You know, Canada is just, you know, and if you have a decent brain that you haven't completely destroyed with recreational drugs, yeah, you can get a good job and live a good life. Like I, I see Canadian people living very good, comfortable lives, but that's it. When I left Canada, I knew that was what I was leaving. I was leaving comfort. I was leaving the land of easy money. You can make money working as a dishwasher and you can survive. But I, but I'm, I didn't want to live just to survive. I wanted to, I wanted to be alive. Why did I think that I had to be very poor to be alive? I don't know. It just seemed like that's the way to be alive. Like you have to go right down to the bottom and look at yourself and say, well, can I do this? Can I live in a country where I don't have a job and I don't speak the language and everything is very foreign to me? Can I do it? Do I, do I have the will to do it? I could do it, but I really, really struggled. Like oftentimes people would look at me like, what are you doing in this country, man? Why don't you go back to Canada and, you know, settle down and make some proper kind of a life for yourself? But I didn't want to. I was very happy living my Hungarian artistic life. This is Grant Loves Books. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Please share with your friends on Facebook. That really helps me a lot. Please do it, all right? Copy, paste, you know, this guy is making YouTube videos. Have a look. That's all you need to do and it helps me a lot. Siesto. <laughs>